دکتر ستلوب Hello and welcome to the Washington Institute. I'm Rob Satloff. I'm the director of the Institute. I'm delighted to welcome all of our viewers today to this very special event, whether you're in America, you're in Lebanon or elsewhere around the world. Thank you for joining this very important and timely discussion. Uh, just a, a word of, of, uh, uh, of logistics. Um, uh, today, we're, we're going to have a, a fascinating conversation with our guest at some point Um, if uh, if you as a viewer would like to try to participate in this conversation, you're welcome to send me your questions. You can do this in one of two ways. You can you can put it in the chat box of your Zoom bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Or if you're on a different platform, please feel free to email me directly at rsatloff at washingtoninstitute.org. Uh, today, our focus is Lebanon, a country, a proud country with a sad and tragic recent history, um, a country whose economy has collapsed uh, largely due to a, uh, a Ponzi scheme led by corrupt politicians, a country that has faced one of uh, the worst disasters in modern times, perhaps um, the largest non-nuclear blast in history at the Beirut port. A country, of course, that suffers under the thumb of Hezbollah and its Iranian patron. Uh, today, we are delighted to host um, one of Lebanon's most important and courageous political leaders, a man who has stood out vocally against Hezbollah's role in the country, um, vocally against Syrian domination and the Iranian role in the country, a man who leads the largest political party with representation in Lebanon's parliament. I'm delighted to welcome um, the leader of the Lebanese Forces Party, Dr. Samir Jaja, to today's uh, policy forum. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Jaja. Um, uh, delighted to have you. I'm delighted to be joined here in Washington by two of my colleagues uh, with special expertise in Lebanon. On my right is Hanin Ghadar, our Friedman Fellow, former editor, managing editor of the Now Lebanon Um, platform in uh, in Lebanon. I'm delighted to have Hanin with us. And on my left, uh, uh, David Shanker, former Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs, our Taubi Fellow and Director of our Arab Politics Program, who's taken a great interest in Lebanon during his service in government. Delighted to have you here with us too. So uh, Dr. Jaja, welcome to the Washington Institute. Um, again, uh, we're all delighted that you could be with us today. And uh, I wanted to turn the floor over to you before we have our conversation, because we're all eager to hear um, some opening remarks from you. Welcome. Dr. Satlov, thank you. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, Mrs. Ghadar and Mr. Shanker are uh, 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 old friends. So I am in the family again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like uh, to begin by expressing my gratitude to the Washington Institute President, Mr. Bernstein, to Executive Director, Dr. Satloff, for inviting me to address you today. I also welcome the presence of our friends, David Schenker and Hanin Radar. Before uh, stating my small note, introductory note, I want just a, a personal note. I will just go into a personal note. Uh, With the beginning of the Lebanese war in 1975-1976, I was a student of medicine at the American University of Beirut. I was, between brackets, obliged to leave because uh, the, the country was, was falling down and to join the Lebanese forces. I am not the heir of a political family. Uh, I'm not in the lineage of the political families in Lebanon. And second, I'm not a career politician. Lebanese forces are not a mere or simple or traditional party. Okay, the Lebanese forces are a party of a cause. And this is very important for us to be known. We are not simply another party uh, 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 looking for some parliamentary seats in here or some cabinet seats in there, no. 
We are a party, of course. Our cause is very simple, two words, to establish a real and efficient state in Lebanon because, because really we lack, we lack, we lack, and we still lack a real state in Lebanon. In my introductory remarks, I will provide a brief overview of the situation in Lebanon, outline the actions undertaken by our Lebanese Forces Party and highlight how the United States can further support Lebanon's recovery. First of all, Lebanon is currently grappling with an unprecedented socioeconomic crisis, really with an unprecedented crisis, not simply socioeconomic crisis, deep, profound crisis which the World Bank, the World Bank speaks about the economic crisis, deemed one of the top three worst economic crises since the 1850s. This crisis has had a profound impact on the livelihoods of the Lebanese people. The national currency has experienced a 99% depreciation since 2019, with inflation soaring at an annual rate of nearly 250 to 300% resulting in the highest food price inflation globally. Over 50% of Lebanese citizens now live below the line of poverty, and unemployment has soared to maybe 35, 40, 45%. Furthermore, individuals have been stripped of their bank savings. Compounding these challenges, state institutions are paralyzed, lacking a president, a functioning government, and a legislating parliament. The culprits, without being partisan, really with all the, of all the possible objective mind in the world, the culprits behind this crisis are a mafia militia clique led by Hezbollah, an unlawful and radical group that employs violence, it employed violence, violence intimidation, and bribery to coerce and lure political factions and leaders, many of them unfortunately are very weak, into looting the state's resources and bankrupting the nations for their own corrupt personal gains. Hezbollah and his allies pose the primary obstacle to the election of an honest and independent president. Proof of this is the last parliamentary session. The revitalization of state institutions and the implementation of much needed reforms. Between brackets, between brackets, Hezbollah doesn't go, and you know there are antinomies in this world. Hezbollah and reform doesn't go together. For, 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 for structural reasons, for real reasons. For the Lebanese forces, the Lebanese Forces Party has been at the forefront of the national effort to challenge Hezbollah's hegemony through various means, which include, and including, first of all, exposing Hezbollah's detrimental actions to the public and the media in distributed statements and published reports and analyses. Second, informing alliances with political forces to counter Hezbollah's influence. And this, at this point, we are having many difficulties because many political function, uh, fun, uh, factions and independent politicians, they don't want to challenge Hezbollah. Three, preventing Hezbollah's control over government institutions, starting with the parliament, securing a significant victory in the 2022 parliamentary elections resulting in Hezbollah and his allies to losing their majority currently, the Lebanese Forces Party, recognized as Hezbollah's staunchest political opponent, holds the largest bloc in parliament, yet this is not sufficient. Challenging Hezbollah's dominance, not only in parliamentary elections, but also every day in universities, professional associations, syndicates, okay, unions, and municipalities. And then, we are emphasizing good and responsible governance. Not you know, our job is not simply to counter the uh, the uh, negative effect of Hezbollah, but to to give a good example of respons responsible governance. And really, we managed to do it, proposing reforms, showcasing 
the exemplary performance of, Li of Lebanese forces, MPs, and cabinet ministers. Even Hezbollah's people, okay, they, they recognize or they acknowledge the probity of, of Lebanese forces ministers. And then upholding the role of legitimate security forces, insisting every now and then the Lebanese army maintain the monopoly of the use of force and helping the local communities when necessary to take action on the ground when aggressed by the Hezbollah militiamen, such as in the unfortunate Tayuni incident in 2021. Opposing Hezbollah's presidential candidate at all costs, Hezbollah is very serious in the candidacy of Mr. Frangi, and he will go out of his way to do whatever is necessary in order to be able to bring Mr. Frangi to the presidency. And we are doing whatever is necessary to prevent him from doing it. And presenting alternatives, Lebanese forces are presenting alternatives through sovereignist reformist figures. Now, you, you, can, you can ask me, okay, what is our business for, with Lebanon? Why Lebanon is important for us? It is important for us as Lebanese, whatever, but for you for Americans and for the free world as a whole. A free, sovereign, independent, democratic, and pluralistic Lebanon aligned with the interests of the free world. When Lebanon was free from the control and interference of radical regimes such as Syria and Iran, and when extreme militias like Hezbollah didn't hold sway in Lebanon, Lebanon served as a friend and a safe haven for the citizens of the whole free world. This Lebanon exemplified religious tolerance, promoted peace and moderation in the region and stood against whatever is radicalism and terrorism. I jump now to the United States. The United States has played a pivotal role in supporting the Lebanese people. The Lebanese people struggled to free themselves, first of all, from Syrian occupation, and then try to rebuild state institutions. Over the past 15 years, the US has invested significant political and diplomatic efforts in Lebanon and provided substantial security, economic and humanitarian assistance to state institutions. First among them is the Lebanese armed forces, internal security forces and the Lebanese people amounting to over $6 billion. We are really and immensely grateful for this support. However, Lebanon and its people continue to suffer and the situation is deteriorating. Therefore, U.S. policymakers should, should, first of all, direct their political engagement toward those fighting for sovereignty and integrity. I will pause a bit in here, I pause a bit, to say that the actual attitude, even though we are grateful for the United States, for what the United States did for Lebanon, but if you, you want me to symbolize a bit the attitude of the, this administration towards Lebanon, it is an innocent bystander, really. <laughs> Second, ensure that the next president of Lebanon is a champion of state authority, constitutionality, judicial independence, rejection of militia rule, respect for international resolutions, and the restoration of Lebanon's relations with its Arab and international traditional allies and then implementation of necessary structural reforms to pull Lebanon back from the brink of collapse. And also the United States uh, policymakers should continue providing critically necessary humanitarian assistance to Lebanese people out of big need. Maintain security aid to the Lebanese armed forces. This is extremely important. And the internal security forces with the objective of protecting Lebanese citizens, securing the borders with Syria, supporting the UNIFIL mission in the South. Also, I, the, I, I will pause a bit in here to say that if it were not for the Lebanese army and Lebanese internal security forces, the situation in Lebanon uh, would have been much, much, much worse than it is. Finally, and as importantly, the United States policymakers should take into consideration to counter Iranian influence in Lebanon. 
Iran's continuous actions undermining Lebanese sovereignty, smuggling weapons into the country, directly defying UN resolutions and actively contributing to Lebanese and regional instability. Lebanon faces the imminent danger, and really this is an imminent danger, of becoming a completely failed state, susceptible to the takeover of malign groups that threaten not only the Lebanese nation, the Lebanese nation, but also regional stability and US national interests in the Middle East. As Lebanese, it is our duty to confront this threat, but we also rely on the support of Lebanon's friends, primarily the United States, and in our struggle and United States uh, importance to aid us in our struggle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was a, a very important statement. You covered lots of different important issues, uh, and I and I'm very grateful. Let me let me start our conversation, if I can, with um, by asking about one of the topics that you 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 referred to, which is the state of the presidential election, which is what garners headlines today. It's not the only issue, but it's it's uh, it's 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 certainly a um, a key issue. Could you give us your assessment of of where we are with this? What are you looking for in a president? What is the the situation of the of the uh, the, the the current candidacies and and what how do you how can you achieve the election of a president um, um, that can begin to do the sorts of things that you're laying out for change in Lebanon, given the uh, the political circumstances you just described? Dr. Satloff, you are very optimistic. First of all, we are in a very deep, deep stalemate. Why the stalemate? Because this time, and for, for many reasons I will not go into, reason that has to do with the regional situation and with Hezbollah's situation inside Lebanon, Hezbollah is intent more than any time else to bring a president of his own, not a simple president not a president that he is not against him. No, no, a president of his own. And this is why he chose Mr. Suleiman Frangi. And this is why he is intent on bringing Mr. Suleiman Frangi. The plan of Hezbollah is very clear. Yani either you, you accept Suleiman Frangi as president or there would be no elections. The proof of it is the last session. In every session we had had until now 12 parliamentary election sessions, okay? In each one of them, what Hezbollah did is that they went into the first round, and of course the first round is not decisive anyhow. And then once the first round ends, they will go out of the session and then we'll lose quorum. And he will continue this way ad, ad vitum aeternum until we accept Islam and Frangi. And at the same time, we will not accept Mr. Islamian Frangi. So we are in a deep, very deep stalemate, but this stalemate cannot be solved uh, in the way our friends, and I, I stress the point, they are our friends, again, the French, they think of, of ending it. The, the formula of the French, and I like the French, and the French has done a lot for Lebanon, okay. But this time, this is not it. The formula is the following. The French, they know what Hezbollah is intent to do. And they jump to the false conclusion, which is, we will not have presidential, Lebanon is in a deep need of presidential elections, okay. We cannot have presidential elections with the boycott of Hezbollah, okay. Then let us have, give Hezbollah what he wants, no. Or this doesn't hold at all, and we will not do it, and we didn't do it, and we will not do it in the future also. So this is why you are in deep soulmate. You'll ask me, okay, what is what is the horizon? Frankly, frankly, at this moment, I don't see you are waiting for Mr. Le Drian in a few days' time in order to see if if we can brainstorm for something else. Of course, not for Mr. Suleiman Frangi or for any, for any other candidate of Hezbollah. Okay. Um, uh, just so our viewers know, um, uh, Dr. Jaja was referring to the former French foreign minister, Mr. Le Drian, 
um, who is due to arrive in Beirut soon uh, with a new initiative uh, to address this issue. Um, no, he doesn't, uh, uh, I'm sorry? No, no. He's not coming with a new initiative. He's coming to see after, after, after he makes what we call état des lieux to see if a new initiative is possible. This is what I have understood. Fair enough. Um, uh, again, let me, let me just uh, remind viewers, if you want to get into this conversation, please send questions to the Q&A function on the Zoom bar or to email me directly at rsatloff at washingtoninstitute.org. Uh, let me turn to my colleague, Hanin Ghadar. Um, Hanin, do you want to uh, sure. uh, engage right now? Yes, uh, it's good to have you here, Dr. Jaja, and uh, I have many, many issues I want to ask you about, but I will just try to focus on a couple of issues that I think might be uh, relevant to our discussion. Of course, the presidency is a big deal, but also there one specific issue which is happening as we speak, the lack of a presidency. You're saying that we might actually have a stalemate that without a consensus of someone that everyone or most people would agree to, there will be no president for a long time, no um, government for a long time, and, and no solution also as well. But in case of a consensus, it means that Hezbollah will have to agree. That means Hezbollah needs certain guarantees on security, cash flow, borders, airport, etc. And meanwhile, we have this news today of the new scheme of getting Riyad Salemi to stay as a consultant at the central bank in order to keep protecting uh, the place. So what's really, what is, what do you think is um, a form of a consensus uh, that would um, Hezbollah not veto? So we have a number of uh, candidates out there, including the army commander, who is now being uh, put on the table as the next uh, uh, suggestion by 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 many? So uh, he might uh, he might not he, he might not if he, Hezbollah might not veto him. This is one. What do you think of this? What do you think is, is going to happen with this next scenario? And another thing, we talked about violence, right? And I think a lot of people today are not encouraged if you want to 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 protest or speak or sp speak freely or do anything uh because uh of this violence or the fear of violence the fear of the threats of a civil war threats of assassination more explosions etc um that's happening because of lack of accountability and when you listed the number of recommendations for the US government the, there has been some work on uh, accountability on the port, but not much on the assassinations and not much into that direction. So what do you suggest should happen when it comes to accountability and, and to, to restrain that kind of violence that Hezbollah keeps threatening with? Uh, the last thing I want to comment on, if you have the time, is the Saudi um, the Saudi stance. Saudi Arabia seems to be very, very absent from Lebanon today. Its ambassador in Lebanon is still meeting with the politicians and people who are, you know, like, but it seems that there's the lack of guidance, not just lack of investment, the lack of guidance for the Sunni street, for political leadership. There is no interest whatsoever by the Saudis in Lebanon. Can you comment on that and tell me if I'm wrong? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Hanin. Uh... I will start from the from the end and and then go up to the, the beginning. For the Saudis, there is a change in Saudi paradigm in, in Lebanon. They are not taking sides, and really they are not taking sides at all. So uh, this, this is their new policy in Lebanon. We have to respect and we have to to act accordingly. And this is what we are doing. This is for the Saudis. Now. For the accountability, and I didn't go into all the necessary details. We have 1,001 details that we can talk about and discuss about Lebanon, but I went into just the, the major headlines. Mm -hmm. So for accountability, and I don't like uh, neither lip service nor literature. For the time being, nothing can be done before you have a real state. And to have your, a real state, you have to start from the beginning. And the beginning is to have a real president. And a real president, they will not they will not allow you to have a real president. So we are in this loop for the time being. So let us keep with the first step, which is to really have a, a real president. 
we we tried the same thing with the last elections last year 2022 and to some degree we managed to some degree but not the, to all the necessary degree otherwise we would have been able to start reforms for instance and accountability and all what you want but unfortunately no we have a parliament a mixed parliament with no uh, uh, clear majority here and there and we are struggling with this, this state of affairs in the parliament but of course it is better than it was than it was uh, before 2022 so this is for accountability now for your first question about the presidential elections if i understood well uh, a consensus with hezbollah okay frankly i don't see you know, first of all hezbollah doesn't have the the uh, appetite for consensus this time i don't know why second we don't have an appetite we ourselves as opposition in order to go to 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 a non-clear compromise and i i cannot find this compromise between us and hezbollah who are diam diametrically opposed and we have really 1000% uh, differences in our goals in our in our in our way to see the state in in the decisions inside the state and the strategic decisions in the military and the security decisions etc but anyhow we are not close to a possible uh, uh, to, a, to a possible consensus but i don't see it for the time being and that includes uh, the possible candidacy of general own first of all dr satlo when you say General Aoun, you have to precise because there is General Michel Aoun <laughs> and General <laughs> Joseph Aoun. We are talking about General Joseph Aoun. Yeah, and to the best of my knowledge, and until further notice, Hezbollah would never agree to General Joseph Aoun. Why? 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 First of all, General Joseph Aoun is a Aounist, only just for your own information. Hezbollah does not refuse General Joseph Aoun because he is a, his own is no at all for a simple reason because he is a man of decision which means he has an independent mind and when he takes a responsibility he, he doesn't accept that everybody would mingle in this responsibility he takes his decisions by himself for this simple reason so I think so, I, sorry you're saying that he will not give the security guarantees that Hezbollah wants no 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 he didn't okay. okay very good let me turn now to my uh my colleague dave shaker david yeah. Your Excellency. However, however, however we turn uh, uh, this day we find friends on your left <laughs> or your right <laughs> well um i'm gonna ask you three short questions and, uh, and i'll let you answer each one <clears throat> before i ask the next um there are some in washington um who don't believe that even a great new president and a great new prime minister or government will make much of a difference as long as Hezbollah maintains its weapons and is willing to kill or intimidate um, its political opponents. Um, what is your vision for going forward? Uh, what can be done to help Lebanon escape Hezbollah's grip? And is federalism an option? Okay, okay, okay. Let me stop at this point because this question is extremely important for me. Because many people, they they ask this question. Okay, even if we get a new real president, what difference will he make? Even if we get a, a new prime minister and a new government. This is not true, David. I'll give you a simple example, okay? In two state institutions now, in the army, the mere presence of General Joseph Aoun, even though he is Aounist at the, at, as a start, okay, it made a difference. Suppose you have General Joseph Aoun or somebody like Joseph Aoun in the presidency. Okay, he will make a difference. This difference is not a cataclysmic one, which means it's not, this, this would be an evolution. This not would be a revolution, which means if you have a real president, he doesn't have to take an army and start uh, start a war against Hezbollah. No, 
but he starts by incremental steps, a step uh, uh, added to another step, added to another step, incremental steps. First of all, it is extremely important that he will take the poison of Hezbollah from inside the state. And this is, and this is nothing, uh, nothing magical or nothing unexpected for a president to, to build a real uh, state institutions. And then he will go out simply, he will not go to Hezbollah alone, no, leave Hezbollah alone. It is enough, it is sufficient for a new president or a new prime minister or a new government, okay, simply to act as such, yeah, to act as a president of the republic, but a president of the Republic of Lebanon, as a prime minister of Lebanon, as a minister in the state of Lebanon. This by itself is very sufficient and will do the job without fighting anybody without going in, into any confrontation. Okay, David. Okay, uh, that's question number one. Question number okay. two. Yes. Um, yeah. What do you think about US sanctions against corrupt Lebanese politicians, the global Magnitsky, for example, the designation of Gibran Basile, Pinanos, uh, Ali Hassan Khalil, et cetera. Should we do more of them? Are they productive? Are they helping? I'll not, uh, I'll not discuss uh, these sanctions specifically because you know, whatever, it would be an uh, embarrassing or difficult to, to discuss, okay, sanctions made by a, another country or somebody from your country. But I'll just discuss uh, 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 sanctions in general, okay. Many people, they, they question the, the uh, efficiency of sanctions. In my belief, whatever, sanctions are efficient. They will not do the job. No, don't believe me, yeah, don't, don't understand me wrong. They will not do all the job, okay? But you no, know, they will add something to what is being done. So in general, sanctions, if it is against Iran, or if it's against Venezuela, or here or there, of course, Iran didn't, uh, uh, didn't fall under sanctions, neither Venezuela nor this, but and they add something to what you are doing against those who, who, who receive the sanctions, okay? Thank you. One last question. Um, hey. There are many uh, in Lebanon, particularly those associated with Hezbollah, but many others, um, who believe that the U.S. designations of banks and bank accounts in Lebanon contributed to the financial crisis. That you currently have, uh, do you believe that's that's accurate or, or has all, any truth in, to it? Inaccurate, at all. This has nothing to do with our economic and financial crisis. Our economic and financial crisis has its basis in the uh, governmental decrees and in the performance of the uh, central bank in Lebanon. Nothing to do with the American sanctions. Proof of it. The first American sanctions were on the Lebanese Canadian Bank in 2012, 13, something like this. Okay. At that time, at that, the financial sector in Lebanon was flourishing and it continued flourishing. So it has nothing to do with it. In the sanctions against a certain bank, against a certain depositors, against a certain businessman, doesn't have to do with, with the whole economy. In Lebanon, the whole economy. Uh, 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 when bankrupt. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I, I agree with you on that. I just wanted to hear it from you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jaja, um, just on the economic question, the banking question, I know that uh, Hanin referenced um, the situation of uh, 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 Riyadh Salama and the central bank. What's your recommendation for how to pull Lebanon out of this economic collapse? Dr. Satloff, very easy. On condition that you start with the political level. In French, there is a saying which says, c'est le politique qui prime, which means a politics comes first. If you have good politics, you'll have everything else. You can have everything else. You have the potential to have everything else good and right. But if politics are wrong, whatever you try to do under the polit wrong politics, you cannot go anywhere. So the, the for instance, I, I'll give you a small example in the economic and financial sector, okay? 
Very small example. Lebanon is now trying, he has been trying for the last two or three years uh, to, to, to take uh, uh, loans from the uh, International Monetary Funds, IMF, okay? Maximum, they will give us how much? International Monetary Fund. Three billion. Three, five, uh, eight billion dollars. Three. This time, you know, which means nearly one billion per year, okay? As a loan, okay. If we have the necessary government, the necessary executive body, smuggling by itself costs Lebanon one billion per year. Why, why do we go to the IMF? Well, it doesn't mean that we don't need the IMF. Now we need the IMF for the signature and, 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 and in order to get the, the, the right image in the world. But no, I'm giving small examples. Okay, tax evasion, tax evasion, at least you have one billion per year. Okay, electricity, at least, at least, at least, you have two billion losses per year. Now it is one billion because they don't have any other money. But if you give them money, uh, okay, they will, they will, they will, they will uh, spend it again to to nowhere. Okay, so what I'm saying is that we have to adjust the political level first. To adjust the political level, we have to we have to decrease the grip of Hezbollah on the central government in Lebanon and bring the, 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 the a real president and a real prime minister and a real, don't bring a prime minister who would who would compromise all the time with Hezbollah because this would lead us to where we are now. Don't bring a government who would uh, compromise all the time with Hezbollah because we, we will stay with the same situation. So if the goal, Dr. Jaja, is to try to limit, uh, shrink Hezbollah's power and influence, um, and you outline a number of things that you hope the United States does. A um, uh, lot of press reports right now that the United States is talking to Iran and is on the verge of, uh, let's just call it a set of understandings with Iran on certain issues. Um, sitting where you sit, how do you interpret this? Do you fear <laughs> that... that uh, um, that this will have an impact on <laughs> on what America yeah, might <laughs> might be willing or not willing to do you in are terms trying of Lebanon. To pull me, you are trying to pull me inside the uh, American <laughs> politics, inside the American politics. I, I think yeah, America can talk with Iran about the nuclear issue. This is something much bigger than us. Frankly, I don't know the details of it. And uh, in, in order to avoid a war in the Middle East, uh, a devastating war, maybe. But this has nothing to do with Lebanon. The United States can talk with America about the nuclear issue, but she can, she can at the same time uh, fend off the, the uh, presence or the influence of Iran in Lebanon. This is something completely else. So I don't link the, the two together, frankly. Okay, good. Um, I have quite a few questions that have come in uh, that uh, that uh, viewers um, around the world are, are eager to ask. Um, let me ask a couple of these and and uh, and let me also turn back to my colleagues who I'm sure have have additional issues they want to get on the table. Um, one of the issues that we read about in Lebanon quite frequently these days is the is the situation and status of refugees, Syrian refugees. And so I'd appreciate your view on um, uh, uh, the appropriate approach to this issue. Um, do you support the, uh, the, re the repatriation, the forced repatriation of, of these refugees back to Assad-controlled territory in Syria? Wait, Dr. Sattler, wait, wait. Uh, I, I, I'll take a bit of your time in order to explain myself on this issue because this is a very important, deep and critical issue. First of all, I, I'm talking about myself personally. I don't have any allergy, any, any what whatsoever to the uh, uh, Syrian refugees in Lebanon. On the contrary, on the contrary, I sympathize with them because I know what is Assad's regime much more than many other people know. So I sympathize with them. Uh, in the years 2011, 2012, when uh, the the uh, revolution started in Syria, it was a real revolution before before Nusra and Daesh came in, unfortunately. So 
uh, it was with receiving the refugees and all of us were, were with receiving the refugees because really there was a reason to receive them because war erupted in every city and country in every city and uh, village and even uh, uh, precinct in, in Syria. And those poor people, they didn't have anything to do except to, flu, to flee uh, their lands. Okay. But look, Dr. Sattler, now after, after 12 years, 12 years, the situation in Syria is demilitarized. Yani there are no military actions in there except some, some punctual raids rather than military action. Okay. Uh, before telling you this, I'll tell you something else. Two years ago, uh, uh, Syria held, held, or the Syrian regime held, what you call presidential elections. Of course, there is no presidential elections in Syria. You know, this is a, a, it's a, more than a soap opera. Okay, it held. Okay, Dr. Satlov. And uh, all, she, she held also, uh, she allowed the, the refugees in Lebanon, Turkey, everywhere uh, to, to go and vote for whomever they want. There was nothing else than Bashar Assad. In Lebanon, 200,000, at least 200,000 of the Syrians who are refugees in Lebanon, they went to the embassy. These are numbers. This is reality. And they voted for Assad, 200,000. And as a matter of fact, we had a problem with some of them because they, they, they went into some of our uh, uh, near our centers near our party positions, okay, with the Syrian flags and with the photos of Mr. Bashar Assad, and this we cannot support, frankly. Anyhow, now the state of affairs in Syria. What is the state of affairs? We have Syria. Nearly 60, 65 percent of the Syrian uh, land is with Bashar Assad, and 30, 35 percent with the opposition, mainly in the eastern. Uh, in the eastern northern part of Syria, which means the area of, of, of Qasad, of the Kurds, let me put it this way. Okay. Every Syrian citizen in Lebanon, he had the possibility of going either to the Assad region, if he is with Assad, or to the opposition region, if he is with the opposition. As opposition, he has the, the Kurdish region, and he has another region also, which is Idlib. In Idlib, okay, you have about a, a, a gathering of 3.5 million Syrians in there. This on one side. On the other side, many, 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 and I think in the hundreds of thousands of the Syrians present in Lebanon, okay, they go to and fro from Lebanon to Syria every month, every day, every week, okay. For instance, in the last, uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, Ramadan uh, feast, okay, hundreds of thousands, they went to Syria and they spent Ramadan with their relatives in Syria and their villages, and then they went, they came back to Lebanon. I'm, I'm telling all of this to say what? To say really th there is no legal basis for anybody to be a refugee in Lebanon these days. When there was a legal basis, a real basis, okay, we, we accepted them. And all the Lebanese opened their houses and their hearts for them because these are belligerent people. But now there, there's no reason. And illegally speaking, you cannot talk now of refugees. You can talk of Syrian compatriots who are in Lebanon. Okay, if this is the, if this is the case, then they should comply by the Lebanese rules which means to have visas or whatever, to have legal papers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this all what we are saying. Many people, they, 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 they discuss uh, wrongly the situation as if war is still uh, in raging, in, uh, raging in Syria. And if somebody goes back to Syria, he will fall under a bomb or, or with a bullet. No, this is not the way, frankly. So this is my opinion concerning the Syrian, uh, what we call the Syrian refugees. Nowadays, they are the Syrian citizens in Lebanon. Okay, thank you. Um, I have, uh, let me ask one more question then I'll turn back to my colleagues. Um, it's about the situation of Christians in Lebanon hmm. and the 
general sense that Christians in Lebanon, I have four questions all on the same theme from different people. Uh, Christians in Lebanon have no future given the recent past. Um, uh, 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 do you dis do you disagree? Do you think that uh, that uh, um, uh, and and what do you say is the best strategy in the long run um, uh, to sustain a um, uh, a robust Christian presence in Lebanon? I completely disagree. If China has become one point four billion, it doesn't mean that the United States has no future. China can become. 2.8 billion people and still the United States has the future that it has on his, its own merits. Uh, I, I completely disagree. Lebanon has been in Lebanon for history. In all along the history, we are, we are very proud of being Lebanese, uh, Christian Lebanese. Uh, and we are very proud that many times we, we could do some good to Lebanon, to the whole Liban Lebanese population, and even to many of the other Arab populations. If in the last 30 years, we had, uh, we had a, 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 a twist of history, and we had, first of all, the Syrian regime, and you know what is the Syrian regime. And then now we have Hezbollah, and you know what is Hezbollah. Okay, this doesn't mean that the Christians in Lebanon have lost never at all at all. And look, for, for the time being, for instance, for now, the, uh, the struggle all over the, uh, the Middle East is between Sunnis and Shiites, okay? In Lebanon, we have Sunnis, we have Shiites, and we have Christians. Except in Lebanon, the struggle is between whom and whom now? Between Shiites and Christians. Why? Because the Christians, uh, Christians are in here, and they have their free wor word to say, and they have their free uh, decision, and they don't accept any hegemony neither from Hezbollah, nor from the Syrian regime, nor from Iran, nor Syria, nor, nor, nor from anybody else. So on the contrary, of course, a lot has been taken as if the, 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 the only criterion to take into consideration is the demographic one. False, this is not true. I wish the Muslims would become 1 billion also, but we are not decreasing. We are increasing, but in, the, in, in our own terms, and in the way we see that we should increase. We, we are not making a race of, of, of a demographic race with others. No, we wish all the good for all other communities, but this is our, our rate of, of birth and we will not change it, okay? And, but at the same time, we don't accept this, that others would use the demographic element in order to decrease our role. No, this is unacceptable at all. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dave, then Hanin. Thanks, Dr. Jaja. Um, I wanted to hear your, your assessment of, um, of UNIFIL. I know you spoke, uh, mentioned them before um, as being something uh, positive. Um, but of course, we had the, the, the murder of the Irish peacekeeper last year. You have increasing harassment of UNIFIL. Um, no access to private property, green without borders, uh, Hezbollah now having shooting ranges in the south, walking openly with their weapons. Um, is UNIFIL playing a positive role? And uh, do you think that it should remain at 10,500 troops? Uh, is this too many? Are they not doing enough? Better than nothing. Of course, they are not. They are not playing the role they 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 were uh, uh, made to to. They were established to play. But uh, their presence is better than nothing. Really, this is the word. <laughs> of course, they are harassed every now and then, in every village, in every street. And unfortunately, we had one Irish soldier killed uh, six months ago, nearly five months ago. But uh, I prefer the, their presence on the contrary, to, to the contrary. Thank you. 
Um, on, on this issue, uh, not the UN, but the security issue, um, what are the prospects of another war between Hezbollah and Israel? Like what Hezbollah, this deadlock that you're talking about can produce many issues and, you know, uh, cri like cr a crisis that would lead to another crisis, a security crisis at the border. Or maybe this deadlock also would cause uh, another thing that Hezbollah might push for. We've been hearing about the uh, three power sharing in the parliament, like changing the system into a more three power sharing uh, in the parliament instead of half and half. Hezbollah has been talking about this. So what Hezbollah, you uh, after a long deadlock, go for this? Uh, uh, or what do you think like another uh, prospect uh, between uh, uh, prospect of another war between Hezbollah and uh, Israel would uh, is, is, is an is an option a, a war with Israel will not help Hezbollah in any of his internal schemes in, mm. in, in the Lebanese schemes on the contrary mm. um, it will do bad to Hez of course to Lebanon and to Hezbollah as a matter of fact, between brackets, maybe all of us uh, these days need a, a Mu'tamar Ta'sisi, which means uh, you know, to, to look into, again, to look into the Lebanese uh, system because, frankly, this is not working. You know, but that's with, not what Allah wants. With every president. No, no, we are in the, in the other direction. Lebanon yeah. needs more decentralization, well, not the contrary. With every presidential elections, we will spend one, two, three, four years in order to have a president. Okay. With the nomination, every prime minister, we need one, two, three, four, five, six, nine months in order to, to design a prime minister. And then to form a government, we need one year, two years. And, and, and with every de delay, the citizen is suffering. Why? And we have to try to dissociate the, our political problems from the livelihood of, of the citizens. And this cannot be done. I remember, for instance, not I remember, and I see, I remembered, and I see that in, in Belgium, for instance, yes, now and then, the formation of a government may take one or two years, but meanwhile, the citizens are not suffering. Why? Because it is a decentralized system. Well, why not to go to such a system? So, but let us put this aside. This is on the only, because you talked about the Mu'tamar Sisi, okay. Now, I think Hezbollah will go to war against Israel in only one, one case, I think, which is if Israel attacks Iran. Mm. In that case, I think immediately Hezbollah would go into, it would be a devastating war mm. for Lebanon, for the region. So maybe this is why. And in this case, I have no doubt. Other than this case, I don't think Hezbollah will go to a war against uh, Israel because, you know, the balance of power is clear in this respect. So um, that's it. This is why maybe, maybe, I'm not trying to defend the American administration. Maybe this administration is trying to do something with Iran, in my belief. Nothing could be done with Iran because in Iran, the system is an ideological and dogmatic one. This is not a practical one, even though they can be practical sometimes, but tactically they can be practical, not strategically. They are trying maybe to convince Iran not to go along with this nuclear program in order to avoid a, a war between Israel and, and Iran. I don't know if this will succeed or can succeed. Another small thing, do you think, yes or no, short question, do you think the street protest will ever come back? I think what? The protests, the 2019 protests, not necessarily that big, but do you think the street will ever be active again? Ah. Do you think the people will go to the street again? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think so. Because, 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 c'est du déjà vu. Mm. People went into the streets. Look, honey, people, everybody went to the streets from the north to the south of Lebanon, from the Sunnis to the Christians to the Shia, so everybody in Lebanon, all the streets and places, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, they, they, were, they, were, they were filled with, with people uh, protesting and uh, demonstrating, et cetera, et cetera. For month and month, not for one or two or three days. And it was not just a 
is mm. simple, simple, uh, uh, simple throw. No. And irrespective of all of this, you had a parliament like this parliament. And mm. despite all of this, you know, you, know, you ended up with the actual situation. Is it possible that after such protests, who were really fantastic protests, okay, this is the eighth month of presidential vacuum after such protests? So this mm. is why everybody came to the conclusion that we can protest as much as you want in Lebanon, but to no avail, unfortunately. Okay. I have to, just to pursue that, your, your comment, it, it, yes. it, from where I sit, it just seems so, I don't know, remarkable, amazing. The Lebanese currency, as you said, lost 99% of its value. Yes. People lost everything. And yet, yes. For many Lebanese, they wake up and they 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 try to go about their regular life. How, how do they do that? This is rather a sociological question rather than a political one. We need to make a, a pay, and I wish some sociology professors will make a paper, whole papers, rather papers on this issue. But I have uh, small hints here and there. Uh, Frankly, uh, after all what happened in Lebanon, there is a change, yani, a change happened, but where? Within the Christian community only. Why? In the Christian community, the FPM, they were the majority. Now the Lebanese forces are the majority. I FPM, just for our viewers, FPM is the, the party of the Free patriotic movement, which is not a nor patriotic nor movement. I mean, the people of the empire. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 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 okay. There is a change that occurred in these areas, okay? In the other areas, for instance, the Shiites are the most touched by the crisis, okay? And nevertheless, they returned their deputies as they were before the crisis. So tell me what to do. But really there was a change within the Christian community in this sense that there was a majority on one side and, and this majority has become a minority, and the minority has become the opposition has become a majority. But this is not sufficient in Lebanon, unfortunately. You need to have the same thing within the Shiite and the Sunnis communities, which didn't happen. And do you see any pros do you see any prospect of this occurring at a different rate among those communities? Unfortunately, not. Do you know why? Because Hezbollah managed to make the Shiites in Lebanon live in the year 1460-70, which means, which means, okay, which means, which means, which means, which means the Shiites, they are, they are completely polarized, okay? As if somebody is coming to kill them, all of them, okay? And, and, and it, it, it doesn't matter for small economic matters in here, for the financial problem in there. What, what matters now is to preserve the community. And what preserves the community is to continue to have Hezbollah and Amma. And this is, of, this is the, the state of mind of, of the Shiite community in Lebanon, unfortunately, but this is it. Or because they don't have an option, a choice. Huh? You, have, you have multiple Christian leaders uh, and more of like semi-democratic kind of uh, system, but uh, the Shiites, uh, they have only one choice or fear. So that that works. But why they have one choice? They Why they don't have other choices? Theoretically, they, they can have other choices. They kill them. Because, <laughs> because they, were got, they are polarized. You know, no. they, they are very polarized. Uh, 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 they are very polarized around this idea. You know, this is an existential idea. It doesn't have anything to do with, with economics from here. Even, for instance, now, what is, what, is the, what is the political speech of Hezbollah now? Is that our economic problems, they emanate from American sanctions. And everything they put it, they put it as if somebody is attacking Lebanon, attacking the Shiite community. And this is why the population doesn't react. So... Well, it's like I, 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 I have a different theory on that, but that's a different topic. But I do encourage you to read our latest Lebanon poll, which tells you a lot about the changes within the Shia community. 
this is to discuss. Russians and Institute New Lebanon poll that is coming up. I don't. All right, we'll send you the polling data because it's quite fascinating. Um, uh, I'm afraid that on that note, we're going to have to bring this discussion to a close. We try to be prompt at at exactly an hour. Um, uh, This has been a uh, a terrific and eye opening discussion. I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Jaja, very much. Uh, I, I know that I join with uh, with Dave Schenker and Hanin Hadar in thanking you and in thanking all of our uh, visitors from around the world um, who tuned in for today's discussion. Um, uh, uh, Lebanon does not get all the attention it deserves. Um, uh, and hopefully um, some of the ideas that came out of today's discussion will filter their way to the powers that be. And uh, and hopefully we'll be we'll be back with you before long. And hopefully we'll have even better news about Lebanon's situation when we next meet. So thank you very much for joining us on this Washington Institute Policy Forum. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this chance. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.